Kia ora so I can um, put Matthew at ease, but it is not going to be... The calculations yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do actually have... Um, so, we actually got an email in uh, from a guy uh, asking about one of their ancestors, Arama Karaka, and they said I was looking for information on a Māori chief called Arama Karaka. And they'd been up at a, the 150th of New Zealand Wars um, commemorations. And so, these are the kind of queries we often get uh, within the ministry. So, where we first start off looking through is, I generally start with DNZB, is there a Dictionary of New Zealand Biography entry um, on this person? Because if, if we can, we can just direct them straight to to that person. Um, but in, in this case, there wasn't. Um, there were a number of results, if we search through um, DNZB, and actually that's where I'll try and flick through here. Uh, what's my problem? Sorry. So just in case you're not familiar with the Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, um, it basically has uh, three and a half thousand uh, New Zealanders uh, in it, and of those three and a, uh, three and a half thousand uh, New Zealanders, around 500 are Māori. Uh, historical fi figures up until um, covering figures up until uh, people who sort of flourished around the 1960s. So we're getting into a bit of a gap now, um, largely done as a project around um, the um, 150th of the treaty, and um, Matthew's dad had quite a significant part to play uh, within uh, these biographies. So they're pretty solid. So we start there, so I have a search through and find out that yes, Arama Karaka is mentioned through other biographies, but there is no biography of Arama Karaka. Um, and the other downside was as I was looking through uh, just the DNZB biographies, it became clear that there was more than one Arama Karaka. Uh, in fact, there were a number. And so the very short answer to the question, who is Arama Karaka? Arama Karaka is actually the Māori form of Adam Clark. And um, what happened is that uh, he was sort of, his name was used in homage, in a sense, when um, missionaries went around New Zealand baptising Māori. And this is one of these really interesting ideas about, we take it for granted today that you might have a, a first name, a surname, possibly a middle name, and that that is kind of the convention for names. Now, um, traditionally for Māori, Māori would often have one name um, or a variety of names used uh, in different contexts, but a, a, a name, not a surname, because you didn't need a surname, because um, when we have Te Kaninga Takiro, he didn't need to say, my name is, you know, Te Kaninga Takiro Smith or whatever, because what he would say is, um, ko hikurangi te maunga. so my mountain is hikurangi. So we had, uh, and um, someone used to talk about this uh, sort of Māori in terms of identification had this form of what she described as triangulation. That once you sort of take the name plus um, the pepeha, which includes the, the mountain, the awa, um, who the important tipuna was, people could actually work out quite clearly who that person is. And, and you'll see that often when people start working through, rather than saying who are you and who are your parents, they'll start very broadly out from me, we work their way into hapu and then say, oh, you, are you so-and-so's child or whatever. So, um, but we're still lef left with this, this problem of arama karaka and um, we have, um, for instance, one of the people we have is arama karaka mokunui arangi. So his first name, or his original name, was Mokunui Aring. He gets Arama Karaka put on, that double banger first last name, and then he can end up being either Arama Mokunui Arangi, Arama Karaka Mokunui Arangi, um, or just Arama Karaka. And that's when it gets really difficult, um, because uh, reflecting on some of the sort of digitisation issues we have now, where we think, oh, maybe if... We've got all this stuff being digitised and coming along, early New Zealand books and uh, 
uh, in ZDTC um, and uh, uh, let's see the uh, AJHRs, that kind of thing. Kind of thing. Oh, maybe if we can, you know, automate this. Maybe we can pull all that information in together. But one of the real big problems with that is how do you tell? How do you tell which person is which? Um, so. I wasn't expecting a blank slide. There we go. So here are just some of the aramakarakas that you will find um, from 19th century uh, New Zealand. Aramakaraka te rai, uh, raiuaua Taranaki, aramakaraka haututu te rio hau up north, aramakaraka kukutai Ngati Tupa around Waikato, um, aramakaraka te aho, uh, also Waikato, aramakaraka of Ngati Raukawa, Aramakaraka Mukunui Arangi Ngāti Rangituhi and Aramakaraka Pi Waima, who uh, named his son Wurumu Aramakaraka just to sort of make it all a little bit confusing. Um, so um, in terms of, uh, oh, I've actually got uh, examples of, so Aramakaraka Mukunui Arangi leading Te Arawa chief Head of the Ngāti Tu Whariti Hapu based at Matata. Um, he gave his early support to the Crown during the New Zealand Wars. Karaka led his people in campaigns against the Ho Ho follower, followers of Kiriopa in 1865 and as a member of the Te Arawa contingent led by Captain Gilbert Mayer. Played a prominent role in the hunt for Tukoti, um, often hideously mispronounced as Tukuti. Um, so very easy way to remember that one there is that um, core uh, te rhymes with me, like from The Simpsons. Um, core rhymes with awe, shock and awe, and when people saw to core tea, there was a bit of shock and awe. And T, T for two. So te, core tea, nice and, nice and easy. So, um, um, uh, another uh, Aramakaraka, Araka, Aramakaraka P of Te Mahuri Huri, um, and he was perhaps what most well known for marrying Hariata, who was previously married to Honeheke, another well known figure. Um, and as I noted, his son was Wurumu Aramakaraka P. Uh, Aramakaraka P also signed the Treaty of Waitangi at Mangungu, um, and this becomes relevant right at the end of my talk. Um, around treaty signings. And another one we have, and this is in DNZB, which sort of illustrates one of the issues, is uh, Aramakaraka from Taranaki, who is just goes by Aramakaraka. Um, and talking about uh, May the following year, Rawiri's people who had rallied under the leadership of Aramakaraka, relative of Rawiri, were besieged at Niniopa by Katatori and Tarangitaki with their Te Atiawa followers and Ngāti Ruanui allies. Uh, as it was a desperate situation, Aramakaraka sought aid from Ihaia. So, I mean, it, the obvious thing here is when we're talking about differentiating, that if they have, you know, part of that name through, that's an obvious way. Except, of course, that in secondary sources, the historical secondary sources, often sometimes are the right, sometimes the writers are confused about which person we're talking about. So they'll get it wrong. They'll give you the name of another person. Um, but be kind of not quite right. Now, we take for granted the fact that today we kind of have this unique um, way of identifying and differentiating um, ourselves from other people, um, which is basically the birth certificate. Um, but this is a relatively newish um, thing. Um, in, it, it wasn't until 1930 that official Māori birth and death death records were kept, but not reliably until the Second World War. So what we have is up until kind of uh, around 1950, this really uncertain issue around who people are. Um, and if we're doing kind of authoritative historical research, that becomes um, a potential uh, difficult liability. So. Um, One of, the, one of the sort of things looking through was, okay, well, what do we do? What's a way to sort of approach this? Um, 
And the first place I started actually was uh, internally we have a database, the BIS database, um, brief information sheets, which whenever someone was potentially up to have a DNZB entry done of them, um, then someone would fill out these brief information sheets. And sometimes this information, which is, it's held internally, so this is not online currently at the moment, so it's held internally. Um, and some of this information is actually amazingly good. Like it's really good, it's referenced and, and that. So the, the initial thought was there's 500 mod DNZB entries and 2,000 Māori uh, entries in here. Maybe I should just look at sort of tidying that up and doing some work around there and starting there. The problem is that as I, as I found out working through that there was some really useful content in there, some average to poor content in there and some just really pointless content. Um, there was uh, one for uh, Tutaka Ngaho, who's a well-known uh, Tuhoi chief, who had been put in as first name Tutaka and last name Ngaho, which isn't, you know, they'd just broken his name in half. And there was no other information, no iwi information or whatever. So if I worked through that, that would be a lot of effort and time going into tidying up something which was very variable quality. So what we did instead was cherry picked and pulled out the good stuff to start working on. Um, and then I had um, Mark Darby uh, uh, sort of work through and write up short biographies. Um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll get onto that. But um, before we do, um, yeah, so anyway, that wasn't going to work in terms of your sort of identifying a person. I looked around at other things. There's also Fletcher's Māori Names database. I don't know if people have come across that. That's Waikato University has, have digitised that um, with the help of, um, I think they got the records from um, National Library. And so that's actually a really good resource. It's got about 13,000 names on it. I should add, Māori Names there means any Māori name. So a person, a place, a thing. Um, a par, um, but it's often a good little starting point. Uh, I went up and had a talk to uh, them, so it's the library that's currently running it, And but what they don't do is they don't create an authoritative name within there. So they'll say, this person here, go and see also um, these other variations of the forms of name, whereas what I'm looking for is kind of an authoritative form of, of the name, so that you can say, yes, also this name, this name, this name, but this is who we consider it to be. Um, and so sometimes you sort of look afar and end up coming back um, a little bit closer. Uh, I was talking to Nancy Schwarbrook, who's now um, the senior editor um, for Tiara, and she said, oh, have you thought of the indexes in the DNZB um, biographies? And actually I hadn't. But when I looked at the indexes, what happened was any time anyone, obviously, is mentioned within a biography, um, their name then appears in the index. And um, what they had done is when they did their name, they might just mention their name within the index, but, uh, sorry, within the, the story, but within the index, they would put what they believed to be their kind of full authoritative name. So there's uh, a couple of thousand names there that uh, have both been macronised and also in the form that kind of follows uh, a set methodology through there. So what, what we've done is we've digitised those um, and got a researcher whose job, and I didn't envy her this at all, she had to go through and check the original version against the digitised version and make sure all the macrons were in the right place. Um, very cheerful about it, I would say. She's very, very cheerful about it. Um, because that's one of the key things is that as well as having a kind of a, a particular form in terms of the name, uh, we want the um, macronised version of that name because that's what people are kind of interested in. They often come to Te Ara for the macronisation of the uh, the place names uh, and the people's names. Um, so there's an example of one of the pages, uh, digitised pages. Now the red red pen there is actually it was printed and then someone meticulously went through checking uh, all five volumes and um, I, th I think it was actually, oh it was, it was Angela Ballara. So fortunately I had Angela Ballara's copies that she'd gone through and checked and she'd gone through and made the changes around the macrons. Um, 
So we have not just a printed version, but the, the kind of QA'd uh, printed version. And so actually that was what um, our researcher had to deal with, sort of these horrible scribbly little red lines, but um, we got there. So, in terms of how I kind of envision our biographies, uh, a little bit like a pyramid, that at the top we have the DNZB, uh, 500 odd, very um, in-depth uh, research going into those, and, and the reality is that the, uh, the time and research it takes to do a full DNZB biography means that um, we'd actually need a lot more resources before we started doing that, um, uh, getting, doing that again. But what we can do in the, sh in the meantime is these short bios, 250 to 300 words, and uh, the name authority will be basically a single line uh, indicating uh, iwi, iwi affiliations and the sort of date uh, that that person exists. So we can kind of differentiate between these people. Um, right, and yeah, that's just a description of that. Um, yeah, mac Macron's a name form following DNZB and Toto Fiddy naming conventions. Uh, right, so what we found when Mark, who I mentioned before, started doing his um, short biographies is in terms of time and resource, um, obviously it's sort of best bang for buck. And what he said was he found that if he was doing similarly um, related biographies, he could get through a lot quicker which sort of makes sense, I mean it's kind of logical. Um, and so uh, I got him to look at the um, New Zealand Wars, biographies of Māori involved in the New Zealand Wars. We have uh, David Green internally who's written a handbook on New Zealand Wars, so I asked him if he could put up sort of 50 of the most important Māori um, that don't have DNZB entries or um, online biographies and we'll sort of work our way through that. And so that's what uh, Mark did and he went through that list putting together those biographies and so here we have on the left uh, Ahu Mai Te Pairata, and she kind of has an extraordinary story and I, I still find it actually amazing that um, we don't have a DNZB biography of her. Um, so Ahu Mai Te Pairata, who was Ahu Mai Te Pairata, as a young woman, uh, she fought alongside her immediate family in Ngāti Rau Kaua at the 1864 Battle of Orako. She was accompanied by her father, Te Pairata, her uncle, a brother named Hitiri Te Pairata, uh, and her husband. Major Mayor, then an officer in the Cavalry Defence Force that was besieging the fortifications at Orako, called on the people within to allow women and children to leave. Ahumai is said to have replied, if the men are to die, the men and children will die also. Now you've probably heard that, or some of you would have heard that, in, uh, al along with Kafafai uh, Tone um, Mato and variations of, you know, we will fight on forever. So they said, you know, let the women and children out, and they said, well, what's, what's the point? If you're going to kill the men, you might as well kill, the, kill us as well. She ended up being one of the few survivors of the ensuing attack. Her father, uncle and husband all died. She survived despite being shot through the torso, uh, shoulder, hit in the wrist, hand and arm. She succeeded in reaching her home at Waipapa near Lake Taupo with her brother Hitori Te Pairata and other survivors of Ngati Te Kohira and Ngati Raukawa. In the following year, Ahumai's people were led by their chief and priest Ao Katoa at the small village of Tataro near Taupo. While they were holding Paimariri rituals, Lieutenant Mead of HMS uh, Kura Corps rode into the settlement. He was seized while a council of war decided his fate. Ahumai, whose wounds were barely healed, walked across the marae and silently sat at Mead's feet, an act which saved his life. More than 40 years later, a white-haired Ahumai Te Pairata could be seen walking into Taupo Township to collect her pension. She died at Mōkai near Taupo in 1908. So, there are a number of other biographies that are kind of like that, that are very significant. The um, New Zealand wars are a very significant part of our history, but under-documented. Um, and, but from this, this also led to um, one of the projects um, working on at the moment, which is for Waitangi 175. So next year, 175th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, and, there's, in terms of the treaty, we often focus on the Treaty Act Waitangi, but there were nine sheets 
that were taken around New Zealand, uh, 50, around 50 signings, around 500 people that signed it. Um, and there's a map of where it's gone. So basically one of the questions that you know followed for me is who were the people that signed the Treaty of Waitangi? And what we have at the moment, uh, oops, I'm doing it on the wrong one, I'll come back to that. So, um, hopefully I'll find this. We might come back to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, that's not going to work. Oh, here we go. Very good. Okay, so what we do have at the moment um, is effectively... Does this will work for me? Yes. So we've got the names, we've got the signing, and what we do know is this basic bit of information about them. Their name, what their probable name was, uh, iwi affiliations, and obviously where they signed and when. But we actually have uh, DNZB information uh, on some of these people, and also as um, we found out when Mark was doing the research, he said, oh, none of the people I'm doing biographies for sign the treaty, but they don't have DNZB biographies. So one of the things we're working um, over the sort of next eight weeks is both writing out little short bits of information about each signing of the treaty, but also trying to do little short bios of every person that we can identify that signed the, signed the treaty. And obviously some of them we won't be able to, um, but it'll be that added bit of information. So as well as just seeing the name there, um, uh, so there, Wurramu Kingi, uh, Wadarapa, then you would have a little bit, a um, uh, bit more information about um, him. Um, yes. Yeah, so, oh, go back to my last man. That's it. Okay. Current slide. And this is kind of a really interesting idea, and I don't know if you can. Oh, you can actually can reasonably well. Um, I kind of like this because it's kind of like, who have we got who there at the signing? And this is one of these uh, sort of examples of how hard it is to find information. This is kind of where people were settled. We sort of had number one, there's Hobson, and he's sort of in the middle-ish, which you'd expect, Nias, and um, who's the captain, uh, James Busby. You've got Henry Williams involved in translation, some of the missionaries, Richard Taylor, number five, and... Um, um, uh, Bishop um, Pompelier and so on and then this massive group from there to there running all the way there and across there which is 13 Māori so uh, I mean to be fair 14 running down there is um, Europeans as well but it just means this information's kind of it's there but it's a bit sketchy and so the main aim of the project is to try and pull out the easily available secondary source information write it up and then most importantly um, make it available on the internet so people can find it. And that is my talk. Oh wait, before I go, uh, Julia, you here? Julia came to make me uh, remind you uh, at morning tea there's um, at the other stand there's like a little questionnaire which you can answer the question who is Arama Karaka for the possibility of winning a book? And now that you know the answer, you're definitely in with a good chance. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, well, just, um, I wasn't going to talk about uh, Mangu, but just the relevance there was that um, he had been one of the treaty signatures. So that particular Arama Karaka 
had been one of the treaty signatures. So obviously, once we start adding that little biography in there, when you click on um, Aramakaraka there, it will come up and say, here's the information we have about him, that short bi biography. Uh, yeah, I think I think so. I'm not actually completely sure. <laughs> I should have checked that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's all. This is all quite checkable. Um, on NZ History has all the various sheets with the kind of um, this form of the name. So nothing that a control F won't solve. Won't solve. <laughs> I, I loved this talk, it made me so excited. Um, thank you, Kirsty, for telling me to come. Um, so I'm at Digital in New Zealand, and we've just started, well, we started last year, and I went away, and I come back, and we're doing a thing where we're trying to link together authorities, so people authorities. Um, and this is, I'm totally, you're not going to be able to leave this room that at the end of this, because really I'm going to grab you. But um, are you going to put these authorities, so obviously the DNZB records are, are up, and that's wonderful. Are the authorities going to be up as themselves on, on the website as, as kind of each each authority has its own URL that we can reference and that is something that's online? That's certainly the no certainly the, that is are. the current plan, I guess, is a short answer. And I mean, I will just straight now say that I tend to have a textual content focus, so I don't think pretty. So I'm quite happy to just go bang, hey, there you are. Um, and if you have a look at the Fletcher's database, it's very similar. It's very basic, but hey, you know, sometimes when you're searching, that is the only information you find, and better that than, than nothing. Yeah, just get it up. Just get it up. Be great. Thank you. Yeah, the, the long answer is we're trying to work out what the plan is. Don't make it pretty. Just get yeah. It yeah. I'm wondering, Basil, if um, what we're also seeing is something where um, a model of biography that is um, Western, Pākehā and European is coming um, against an idea of a corporate identity within a Māori context. And I'm asking that question because I'm trying to probe what does biography actually mean in a Māori context? And whether, you know, going through the process of disambiguation of names is one thing, but I think the bigger issue is actually what are we trying to produce and what are we trying to lock in in terms of um, individual X um, having biography Y and contextualize Z where I would see biography as a networked kind of suite of relationships that seems more uh, in keeping with the notion of identity formation within a Maori setting but runs counter to a European model of disaggregated, individuated, decorporealized in effect. Yeah, and, I mean, on there, if you ha have a look through the Māori biographies in DNZB, what you'll find is not every single one, but the majority of them have whakapapa yeah. in there, so that you can figure out not just who that person is, but how do they relate to um, other people. And that, that, of course, if anyone sort of tried to um, track the Te Huhu Tūkenals and who we happen to be talking at at any particular time becomes really valuable, um, because there's sort of six of them all floating around using that title to who to kennel. Um, and so that whakapapa is a really important part of it. And the thing you do realise as you're going through is, is as important as the information you find out about them individually is, you know, who were, what is that kind of, you know, surrounding, you know, whakapapa, who, who are their um, children? You can't just pull them out in isolation. Long list of um, names in the Māori language of the years. It was later in the very And also the early New Zealand uh, books, collections, the list of names, where the guys very much love to uh, link to the Māori. This night also, I just searched for Aramakaraka and found 29 chapters. Yeah. Uh, kia ora. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I was following on from Chris's question, really, um, but uh, um, I'm also interested in name authorities being put on the internet. Um, 
not, I don't think there's any one, the name authority that's going to go up. There's going to be a, a number of them. Um, I'm with the Turnbull Library and we are putting up names that arise from groups of letters or, or that sort of thing. We may not know, we may not be able to determine which um, person it is to disambiguate it. But we're going to put up an authority set which says this is, this is what we know from this repository, this collection. And it's going to be encoded um, to the um, EAC standard, encoded archival context, which um, is a way of structuring information and separating the, the name, the alternate name, the dates, um, the relationships and so forth. So I guess I'm just um, putting in a plug for whatever you put up as, as the raw data to have some sort of standardised encoding around it so that we can maybe talk to each other um, over time. I've got two answers to that, which is one, Matthew, take note of that. Because um, that sounded important and something we need to know about. Uh, uh, because, yeah, well, uh, it makes sense to do that. And then secondly, in terms of what the, the sort of longer term plan uh, for this content is, you know, first just, just get it out, get it up. But um, I talked around, I talked with uh, Nancy around bringing together the, um, that with the uh, DNZB biographies. So have the, the long form biographies, but where you don't have a long form biography, have the shorter form biography. And then, but once we get it up, if we put it up on Te Ara, then we'll sort of, you know, make it fit with the look and feel of Te Ara, um, and but also, you know, the style guide and all that kind of thing. So, but that's sort of probably, in my thinking, that's kind of like slightly two-ish years away um, because that also involves trying to bring all our Māori content into a single place um, as, as well, so all of it as well as the biographical. If I could just do a follow-on, yeah, it's just a follow-on because um, it, it does make this link very nicely um, in prosopographical studies where people are building what they call, you know, digital people databases. They don't talk about the facts, they talk about factoids. And factoids are those constructions of what we think of as you know, the knowledge to date, but that's historically specific knowledge, that as long as you can track where it's come from, who is the authority at the time who's expressed that, and how you've evaluated that as a piece of information, then you can go back and have actually a very dynamic and live way of creating the lives of people that are historically situated, but also contemporaneously, as in now, um, manufactured. And I guess that's the point, you know, we've got to be, have that extra sort of reflective level of how we're actually creating these lives, even if it's trying to just disambiguate names. Right, on that note, I'm going to thank Basil. Um, and, and, and just to pick up on your, your point, Nicola, we will talk. Um, we're very good at text, back-end systems, to be honest, not so good. Um, so we're keen to talk to anyone who can help with that. But thank you, Basil, for that talk, um, and thank you to everyone who came to the session. It was a good session. Enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Cool.